One thing that I was not taught uh, in graduate school was how to invent. I had to pick it up by osmosis. And this is how most scientists do. But then when I started teaching myself, I asked myself a question. How do I teach my students to invent? So uh, one principle uh, is to reformulate the problem in abstract terms. Uh, we in biology are experimental scientists. So we usually do not deal that much in abstractions. But let me give you an example. In 1950, Chargaff uh, disassembled the DNA uh, and wanted to understand its structure. And he came up with what was known then and now as the Chargaff rule. So the amount of uh, C or cytosines is equivalent to the amount of G uh, nucleotides. The amount of A is equivalent to amount of T. So this is GCAT Chargaff rule. So from that rule then, it took the entire community three years and Watson and Crick to actually see the crystal of DNA to come up with the double-stranded helix structure. Now, I presented that problem in abstract terms to an, uh, uh, a class I was teaching as a volunteer in a high school, and the kids did not know the structure of DNA. And I told them, uh, let us uh, solve a problem. Here you have four elements. We'll call one A, the other T, the third G, uh, the fourth C, and here's the Chargaff rule. A equals T, G equals C. And could you please construct a structure that will satisfy this rule? In about 10 minutes, kids came up with a ladder. It's a ladder structure, of course. A T, G, C, it's a ladder. And that is exactly the two-dimensional structure of DNA. Why do kids solve the problem in 10 minutes? The entire scientific community took three years and a Nobel Prize. Uh, from Watson and Crick, right? It is because the problem was not formulated in abstract terms. Uh, so that is the, pi the power of, of abstraction. In my field, uh, which is antimicrobial discovery and microbiology, uh, I would like to give you another example to illustrate this point, uh, and that is the history and the practice of drug resistance. Uh, so resistance to antibiotics is an enormous problem pathogens resistant to antibiotics rise and spread uh, and threaten our way of, of life. The study of resistance began uh, very long ago with the discovery of uh, beta-lactamases, enzymes that cleave penicillin. It was discovered shortly after penicillin was introduced in the 40s into medical practice. And since then, once in every several years, a discovery would be made about uh, yet another mechanism of resistance. So what I decided to do is reformulate that problem in abstract terms. In abstract terms, here we have a cell, and inside the cell there's a target. And here's an antibiotic. An antibiotic hits that target. That's all. That, that is the entirety uh, of the problem. And then I present that problem to a class of people who know nothing about antibiotic resistance. And I ask them a very simple question. Ideally, from perspective of the cell, how could the cell, in principle, prevent antibiotic from hitting the target? And it takes, again, approximately 10 minutes for the class to realize that the antibiotic can be destroyed, it can be prevented from entering the cell, the target can be modified, and on and on and on. And usually they come up with one or two mechanisms that we do not yet know. So question, why did it take the entire profession 60 years to come up with these mechanisms when someone in 1950 could have drawn this very simple uh, model that I just presented to you, come up with all possible mechanisms and discover them in a, in a couple of years. Uh, again, this is a, an, an illustration of the power of abstracting the problem in, in biology. Some other things that I would like to add to that, and maybe a, a very important one, and that is that separates scientists from people who simply get good grades and then go on to do something else in life, which is also wonderful. But if you want to be a scientist, then you should be able not only to solve problems, but to formulate problems. This is the most important thing, how to formulate a winning project, how to recognize a problem for what it is and formulate it. Uh, that is very important. So, uh, and where do you get that problem to formulate it? Well, one thing that I have been using and that, that I encourage my students to use uh, is to look for paradoxes. Look for things that make absolutely no sense. You read a paper, 
And we people uh, are annoyed when we don't understand something. And we tend to sweep that under the rug, ignore it and move on to things that we do understand. But I uh, encourage you to focus precisely on the things that you do not understand. Because chances are that the profession doesn't understand them either. And that indicates a gap in knowledge. If you can focus on a gap in knowledge, formulate it as a problem, then you have a winning project. When I was a kid, I read uh, a thin little book uh, composed by an en uh, written by an engineer, a Russian engineer, Altschuler, who tried to uh, formalize invention in engineering. And I found it fascinating. Altschuler has a minor following uh, in, in a number of places. For example, in Israel, uh, there's a following uh, for Altschuler. In Japan, here and there, there's seminars, etc. And periodically, I get an email from someone. I publish a paper, and I get an email. And, Are you familiar with Altschuler and his trees approach? Because your paper looks very much like you were reading his, his work. And then I answer yes, indeed. You know, when I was a kid, I read uh, I read Altruder. Altruder came up with uh, a number of principles, uh, and probably the most powerful of these principles uh, is uh, is the principle of a perfect solution. His book starts uh, with uh, an illustration of that principle. The basic idea is not to worry about how you are going to implement an invention. Uh, formulate what you want, not how you're going to get there, and then worry about how you're going to get there. So here was Altruder's example. Uh, he said, so, so here's this uh, plant uh, which produces cold. It's a plant with refrigerators connected to each other uh, with a myriad of tubings, and cold is the product of that plant, liquid nitrogen or whatnot. And of course, periodically, there will be a leak in the tubing so the question is how to identify the leak perfectly. And the traditional approach was to go around and to examine each and every tube and each and every crack and find the leak. And that was, of course, enormously laborious. Here's Altschuler's perfect solution. The only thing that you would like to see is the leak. All right? And it sounds wonderfully absurd. The plant disappears. The only thing that you see is the leak. But once you formulated that, and it's terrific that it sounds absurd, because that means that you're onto something, then you can come up with a technical solution. You can then say, OK, uh, what is it uh, that uh, you can see when you do not see anything else? Well, that's something that fluoresces. So how about putting a fluorescent dye into the tubing, turning off the light, uh, turning on a UV light, and then the only thing that you will see in that plant is the leak in the tubing. And that is exactly how, uh, these days, leaks are determined in the refrigerator plant. I thought that was fascinating. Uh, and so uh, many years later, thinking about a very different problem, a problem of uh, latent cells of tuberculosis uh, that cause uh, uh, tuberculosis, obviously, is a dangerous disease, but um, uh, very often it goes into latent form. Uh, there are no symptoms, but if a person gets immunocompromised by, for example, contracting HIV, then uh, the tuberculosis comes back. So it was hiding somewhere in the latent form. We know absolutely nothing about these cells. We don't know how, how many of them they are, where they are hiding, or how to study them. Uh, and so uh, I was thinking that ideally we could, uh, of course, model that in a mouse. The mouse also has a latent infection. And we can use cells labeled with a fluorescent protein, green fluorescent protein. And so now uh, the cells that actively divide would lose that protein, and cells that went into latency do not divide and therefore do not dilute that protein. And they will always be fluorescent green if we turn on. Uh, the UV light. And that's exactly uh, what, what we're doing, and that allows us for the first time to track uh, latent cells that uh, would have been extremely difficult to come up with this idea if we did not think in terms of ideal solution. Let, let the latent cells be the only thing that we see. And then uh, I also realized that we can invert Altschuler's uh, principle, because he, of course, was an engineer and he worried about you know, building bridges and such. Uh, and as a scientist, I think primarily about 
uh, uh, how organisms and cells function. And then I can ask a question from the perspective of a cell. How would the cell ideally do this or that, right? Uh, and, and that is how, for example, one can envision uh, each and every mechanism that the cell uses to protect itself from antibiotics. So these are some of the principles that I teach uh, in my classes. And, and of course, uh, it would be great uh, if this kind of an approach spread. Uh, and I hope that uh, one of the things that will happen as a result uh, of this recording is that it will spread. And this is one of the uh, advantages, I think, of, of what uh, is being done in this program.